Hi guys, we're ready for chapter 13 today. So you've noticed that some of our chapters are starting to amp up just a little bit. In chapter 12, Brian saw a plane and now he's a little heartbroken because he's thinking that he's lost all chances of rescue. So we're gonna go ahead and start on chapter 13, page 113. Brian stood at the end of the long part of the L of the lake and watched the water, smelled the water and listened to the water, was the water. A fish moved and his eyes jerked sideways to see the ripples. They did not move any other part of his body and did not raise the bow to reach into his belt pouch for a fish arrow. It was just not the right kind of fish, not a good fish. A food fish stayed close in in the shadows and did not roll that way, but made quicker movements, food movements. A larger fish rolled and stayed in deep and could not be taken, but it didn't matter. This day, this morning, he was not looking for fish. Fish was light meat, and he was sick of them. He was looking for one of the foolish birds. He called them foolish birds, and they were a flock that had lived near the end of the long part of the lake. But something he did not understand had stopped him, and he stood and breathed gently through his mouth to keep silent, letting his eyes and ears go out and do the work for him. It had happened before this way. Something had come on to come into him from outside to warn him, and he had stopped. Once it had been a bear again. He had been taking the last of the raspberries, and something came inside and stopped him. When he looked where his ears said to look, there was a female bear with cubs. Had he taken two more steps in, he would have been between the mother and the cubs, and that was a bad place to be. As it was, the mother had stood and faced him and made a, a sound, a low sound in her throat to threaten and to warn him. He paid attention to the feeling now, and it stood and waited patiently, knowing he was right and that something would come. Turn, smell, listen, feel, and then a sound, a small sound, and he looked up and away from the lake and saw the wolf. It was halfway up the hill and from the lake, standing with his head and shoulders sticking out into a small opening, looking down on him with yellow eyes. He had never seen a wolf, and the size threw him. Not as big as a bear, but something that seemed quite large. The wolf claimed all that he was below him as his own and took Brian as his own. Brian looked back and for a moment felt afraid because the wolf was so... So right. He knew Brian. He knew him and he owned him. And he chose not to do anything to him. But the bear moved then and moved away. And Brian knew the wolf for what it was. Another part of the woods. Another part of all of it. Brian relaxed the tension in the spear in his hand. And settled the bow in the other hand. But where it had started to come up. He knew the wolf now as the wolf knew him. And he nodded to it and it nodded and smiled. The wolf watched him for another time, another part of his life, and then turned and walked effortlessly up the hill as it came out of the brush and had followed by three other wolves, all equally large, gray, and beautiful, all looking down on him as they trotted past and away. Brian nodded to all of them. He was not the same now. The Brian that stood and watched the wolves move away and nodded to them was completely changed. Time had come, time that he measured, but didn't care about time but didn't care about time. Time had come into his life and moved out and felt different. In measured time, 47 days had passed since the crash. 42 days, he thought, since he had died and been reborn, the new Brian. When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down, gutted him, and dropped him, and left him with nothing. The rest of that first day, he had gone down, down into the dark. He had let the fire go out and forgotten to eat an, even an egg and had let his brain take him down to where he was done, where all he wanted to do was be done, to where he just wanted to die. He had settled onto the gray funk deeper and still deeper until finally into the dark he had gone up the ridge and had taken the hatchet and tried to end it by cutting himself. Madness. A hissing madness that took his brain. 
There had been nothing for him then, and he tried to become nothing, but the cutting had been hard to do, impossible to do, and he had last fallen to the side, wishing for death, wishing for an end, and slept, only didn't sleep. With his eyes closed and his mind open, he lay on the rock though through the night, lay and and hated and wished for it to end. And though the word cloud down, cloud down through that awful night, over and over the word wanting all of his clouds to come down. But in the morning, he was still there, still there on his side. And the sun came up. And when he opened his eyes, he saw the cuts on his arm, the dry blood turning black. He saw the blood and hated the blood, hated that he had done to himself when he was the old Brian and was weak. And the two things came into his mind, two true things. He was not the same. The plane passing did change him, and the disappointment cut him deep and down and made him new. He was not the same, would never be again like he had been before. This was one of the true things, the new things, and the other one was that he would not die. He would not let death in again. He was new. Of course, he had made a lot of mistakes. He smiled now, walking up the lake shore after the wolves were gone, thinking of the early mistakes, the mistakes that came before he realized that he had to find new ways to, to be what he had become. He had made new fire, which now he kept going using partially rotten wood because the plunky wood would smolder for many hours and would still come back with fire. But that was had been the extent of doing things right for a while. The first bow was a complete disaster that almost blinded him. He had sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. And then he spent two days making arrows. The shafts were willow and straight with the barks peeled. And the fire hardened the points to split into a couple of them to make fork points, as he had done with a spear. He had no feathers, so... He just left them bare, figuring for fish, they'd only have to travel a few inches. He had no string, and that threw him until he looked down at his tennis shoes. They had long laces, too long, and he found that one lace cut in half would take care of both shoes and that left the other lace for the bowstring. All seemed to be going well until he tried. A test shot. He put an arrow to the string and pulled back to his cheek and pointed at the dirt hammock and that precise instant the bow wood exploded in his hand sending splinters and chips of wood into his face. Two pieces actually stuck him in the forehead just above his eyes that had been only slightly lower they would have blinded him. Two stiff mistakes. In his mental journal he had listed them to his father listed all the mistakes He had made a new bow with a slender limbs and a more fluid, gentle pull, but could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was surrounded by the viral cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He would pull the the bow back and set the arrow just above the water, and then the fish was no more, and then inches away released the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him that the arrow had gone right through the fish again, again and again, but the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he stuck the arrow down in the water, pulled the bow, and waited for a fish to come. And while he was waiting, he noticed that the water seemed to make an arrow bend or break in the middle. Of course, he had forgotten that water refracts, bends the light. He had learned that somewhere in some class that he had taken. Maybe it was biology. But he couldn't remember. But it did bend the light, and that meant the fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below, which meant he had to aim just under them. He would not forget his first hit, not ever. A round-shaped fish with golden sides, as gold as the sun, stopped in front of the arrow. He aimed just beneath it at the bottom edge of the fish, released the arrow, and there was a bright blur, a splash of gold in the water. He grabbed the arrow and raised it up, and the fish was on one end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling, held it, and looked at the sky, and felt his throat tighten and swell, 
and fill with pride as to what he just did. He had done food. With his bow with an arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food. He had found a way to live. The bow had given him his way, and he exulted in it, and the bow and the arrow in the fish, in the hatchet in the sky. He stood and walked out down the water, still holding the fish and the arrow and the bow against the sky, seeing him as they fit his hands, as if they were a part of him. He had food. He cut a green willow fork and bent the fish over the fork until the skin crackled and peeled away and the meat inside was flaky and moist and tender. Then he peeled off and carefully with his fingers, tasting every piece, mashing them in his mouth with his tongue to get the juices out of them. Hot, steaming pieces of fish. He could not, he, he thought of them, get enough. All that first day, the first new day he spent on the lake, shooting a fish and taking it back to the fire, cooking it and then eating it, and then back to the lake, shooting a fish, cooking and then eating it, on that way until it was dark. He had taken the scraps back to the water with the thought that it would work for bait, and the other fish came by the hundreds to clean them up. He could take his pick, like a store, he thought, just like a store. He could not remember later how many he ate that day, but he thought it could have been over 20. It had been the, a feast day, his first feast day, and he celebrated being alive, a new way of getting food. And by the end of that day, it became dark and he lay next to the fire, his stomach full of fish and grease from the meat smeared around his mouth and he could feel new hope building in him. Not hope that he would be rescued, that was gone, but hope to his knowledge Hope in the fact that he could learn and survive and take care of himself. Tough hope, he thought that night. I am full of tough hope. 